like to read you a prayer. It's called Wesley's Covenant Prayer. John Wesley prayed this prayer and, and wrote it down probably in his journal. When we were at Palcon, the pastor at College Community Church said that he often uses this prayer with his people and has them recite it. You maybe have heard it or read it. He said, I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed by you or laid aside by you, exalted for you or brought low by you. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, O oh glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine, and I am yours. So be it. And, and the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. That sounds like the prayer of a sanctified person, doesn't it? <coughs> of a person who's totally yielded to God. And I ask you the question this morning, are you sanctified? Are you totally yielded to God? This morning, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I want us to think about what it means to be sanctified holy. Now, you can't tell by the way I say that word which one it is because there are two words for holy. We want to be sanctified holy, but to be Sanctified, holy is also completely, W-H-O-L-L-Y, entire sanctification. And you need to understand this morning that the use of the words saved and sanctified, we're using these words in a narrower sense than the terms themselves imply. Because the word saved really includes everything from prevenient grace to glorification. You are in the process of being saved here on this earth. It started when God first spoke to your heart and, and when there's a first enlightening of your heart towards God. Prevenient grace. It continued as you got under conviction when you heard messages of the truth of the gospel and when you initially gave your heart to Jesus as a maybe as a little child or a teenager or even as an adult. And we sometimes say that's being saved. But it continues on as we grow in grace and as we reach a point where we recognize this is not working very good. I'm wanting to do what's right, but I don't have the power and the ability to do it. And then you recognize as you read your Bible and hear messages, I need to be entirely sanctified. So we're using the term saved and sanctified in that sense. Saved being the initial work of salvation and sanctified being the, the second work of God's grace in your heart after salvation where you rec after the initial work where you recognize there's something more than being forgiven of sins there is the need for my heart to be cleansed of the of, of the nature of sin I want you to, to read follow with me as I read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 beginning with verse 12 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 beginning with verse 12 now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone, Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. 
Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. And then hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. And then these two verses that I want to draw your attention to. May God Himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. That means holy, completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body, that's everything we are, isn't it? Spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. These verses speak very clearly about holiness, about sanctification, and about entire sanctification. The reason we call it entire sanctification is because sanctification begins in the new birth. And in theology, in, the, in, the, in systematic theology, we call that initial sanctification. And I've told you quite a few times, and you've read it in your, in your manual and heard it read, that the initial work of God's grace in your heart involves three things that happen simultaneously. Justification, regeneration, and adoption. Justification is a, is a, a judicial act of pardon. It has nothing to do with, with any change of heart or change of the person's life. What it has to do with is a, is a change in the way God looks at you. You've been pardoned. But regeneration is the change that takes place in your heart. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you have to be born again. It's not enough to be born once physically. You have to be born a second time spiritually. You have to be born of water and born of the Spirit. That's the new birth. Regeneration begins there. Adoption is what God does when you become a pardoned, regenerated person. He adopts you into His family. You are now in a position to be in God's family because before that you were separated from God by your sins. You were apart from God because God is holy and you are born with a sinful heart. So we talk about set salvation and sanctification and we talk about entire sanctification and this scripture very clearly is about entire sanctification because he's talking to Christians he's talking to, to the church at Thessalonica they are already believers they've already trusted in Jesus Christ so he's not addressing them as unbelievers as people who don't understand the gospel he's addressing them as people who are part of the church there that's being established and so this scripture tells us, first of all, these verses tell us the source of sanctification. The source of sanctification, and it's in the first three words of verse 23. May God himself sanctify. May God himself. The source of our sanctification is God. We cannot sanctify ourselves. Then you might say, well, what about verses in the Bible? So it's in Joshua 3, 5, where it says, sanctify yourselves because we're going to go across the Jordan River and so on, Joshua says to the, to the Israelites. Well, there is another meaning of the word sanctify in the Bible. And sometimes people indicate, they, they act like that's the only meaning of sanctification in the Bible. Those that don't believe in entire sanctification, when believe in entire sanctification, will tell you that sanctify means consecration. They'll say that's what it means in the Bible. But when you read 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24, how can you think that that is talking about consecration? Because consecration is what we do. Sanctify yourselves means set yourselves apart. Consecrate yourselves. 
Things were consecrated in the Old Testament. Uh, the utensils that were used in worship, they were consecrated. Those utensils didn't have a heart and soul or anything that needed to be cleaned inside. They needed to be set apart for God's use. And of course, they would be cleaned before they would be used. But sanctify there means set apart, consecrate. But here in this passage, it clearly means something else. It means to make holy. And so these verses tell us about the source of our sanctification. God himself. God is the source of our sanctification. In this regard that it's talking about here, we're not able to sanctify ourselves. We are only able to consecrate ourselves so that God can do the work of sanctification in our hearts. And it needs to be done in every believer. Every believer needs sanctification. Because you cannot be a victorious Christian without it. You will be up and down. You will be blown around by the wind of every doctrine, as the Bible says. You will not have stability in your life. You will be up and down, and you will make promises to God, and you won't be able to keep them, and you'll go to the altar, and you'll get up, and the next week you'll be doing the same things, and you won't have stability in your life because you are not sanctified. You, it's begun in your heart. You, you, regeneration has taken place, and you have the desire to live a holy life, and to some extent you begin to do that as a new Christian, you, uh, the Holy Spirit speaks to you and maybe you set aside some habit that you've been doing or, or something that's been going on in your life. You say, well, now I need to stop doing that because the Holy Spirit has spoken to you. And, and even when you were near the altar, you were thinking about some of those things, some of those practices that you needed to stop doing. But when you got up from the altar from being forgiven of your sins, you didn't have the full power to be able to stop doing all those things that you knew you needed to stop doing. And so as you live, begin to live out your Christian life, you were discovering that you were falling and getting up and falling and getting up. And that's not to say that after you're entirely sanctified, you'll never be able to fall again and you won't ever have to get up again. But there's a stability that is there that you don't have simply when you're born again. And that's what the Apostle Paul is talking about to this church and the source of our sanctification is God himself. He must do the work. God sent his son to be our sin offering to provide for our justification and our sanctification. Justification, our pardoning. Sanctification, our forgiveness and cleansing. So sanctification talks about that purity that we need in our hearts. <coughs> And God is the one who has been offended by our sins. And so God is the one who must be satisfied. We're not simply doing, we're not doing this for ourselves. Now, it, it helps us to be able to live an effective Christian life. But we're doing it for God. Because we can't be a, an effective witness for God if we're continuing to live in sin after we after we're become a Christian. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul talks to the church at Rome about consecrating themselves and being sanctified. He says, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. And he says, this is your spiritual act of worship. It's, in other words, giving yourself, putting yourself on the altar. We don't bring animal sacrifices anymore. Now we, we bring ourselves to God. Jesus is the sacrifice. No more sacrifices needed for sin. Now we yield ourselves as a living sacrifice. And so that's what it's talking about here. It talks about being transformed by the renewing of our minds and so on. So Jesus died for our sins, and God is the source of our sanctification. The Father sent the Son and the Son went away and sent the Holy Spirit. And he said, wait until you are filled with the Holy Spirit and do the power of on high. And that's what happened to those, those believers on the day of Pentecost. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and they were cleansed and purified 